I'm standing here in the country of Jordan on the northwest edge of the Dead Sea and in biblical times I'd be standing in what is called the plains of Moab and behind me is the mountain range called Nebo and it was from this mountain range somewhere up there that Moses viewed the promised land before he died. Moses had led the Israelites for 40 years. God used Moses to deliver his people out of slavery in Egypt using signs and wonders, the plagues. And while they're in the desert, God used Moses to provide them with water and food. But the goal was to get his people into the promised land. But because of something that happened in the desert, viewing the promised land from these mountains behind me was as close as he would get. So at Mount Nebo, we want to gain a sense of perspective of what happens when we fall short of our expectations. And we are continuing our series called Meet Me on the Mountain, looking at mountaintop experiences in the Bible. And in the Bible, a mountaintop encounter with God usually ends up being a meaningful, transformative moment. And so mountaintop experiences are a great metaphor for when we have a transformative moment with God, moments when we encounter God. And the one thing about the trip that seven of us took last month to Egypt, Jordan, and Israel is that we got the opportunity to visit a lot of the mountains uh, that we are talking about in this series. And so um, in that video, I was standing in front of the Mount Nebo mountain range, the place where Moses died, where he fell short of his goal to enter the promised land. And we want to read that scripture this morning. And so we've asked Roxanne Paulson to do that. Roxanne, if you can make your way on up to the podium. And as she does so, I'm going to ask if you're able to please stand and face the center of the room. And we stand because we believe that this is the word of God. And so Roxanne, whenever you are ready, please read from Deuteronomy 34. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land, from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, in the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, and as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Roxanne, thank you very much. You may be seated. Now, the reason that Moses was not allowed to cross into the promised land was something that happened in his story in Numbers chapter 20, um, where God told him to speak to a rock to bring water to the people. And instead of doing that, Moses hits the rock to bring water. And God says that Moses did not honor him as holy by doing that. Now, I don't have time this morning to unpack that whole story and the meaning behind all of that, but it's that failure that keeps Moses from entering the land. And the story of Moses dying on Mount Nebo, I think can be can have a lot of significance to us because all of us, we have plans and we have dreams and we have goals. We have a vision for what we would like our lives to look like, what we would like to experience. And oftentimes our realities do not match that vision. Failures, shortcomings, unrealized hopes, all these different kinds of disappointments sometimes can even lead us to despair. 
You know, the Israelites, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And sometimes it may even feel like that we are just kind of wandering around in an endless desert. And so how do we hold onto the hope that everything is going to be okay when our worlds are turned upside down? How do we do that? I want to give you a picture of how close Moses was to to his goal. There's a map on the screen behind me. And um, I'll just start with the bodies of water. This is the Dead Sea. And if you go up the Jordan River to the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus did much of his ministry, there's Nazareth, his hometown. Jerusalem is right there. Bethlehem is right there. And um, when Joshua took his people uh, across the, the river, it was right in here somewhere. And Mount Nebo is right there. Moses was that close. He was so close to his goal. And yet he fell just short of the promised land. And so I want to give us some mountaintop perspectives of when we fall short of our expectations. Perspectives to help us keep the faith when life doesn't go as expected or planned. And perspective number one is that you are created for a God-given purpose. And when I say purpose, I just don't mean like one moment in time as if you missed that one moment, you've missed your whole purpose. But no, purpose as in a role that you play in God's plan. And so even if you miss an opportunity in life, there is still a purpose, there is still a role for you to play. You've been created for a God-given purpose, a God-given role. In the passage this morning, it says, the Lord said to him, Moses, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants, and I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. Now here at TFRC, we have a class that we uh, offer. It's called Connections. If you want to make, uh, if you want to be baptized, make a confession of faith, or become a member here at TFRC, uh, it's a class that we uh, ask you to take. And actually, it's going on, uh, I think it's in week two this week. Pastor John is teaching the class. I'm going to steal a little bit of his thunder uh, from that. Uh, in that at some point in the class, we share these thoughts when talking about how people are gifted. And we, I, we start with the question, um, what comes easy to you? What comes easy to you? And the reason it's easy for you is because you are good at it. You see, we tend to minimize our gifts because the things we are good at come easy to us. And because they come easy to us, we think they're easy for everybody. But that's not true. It's easy for you because you're good at it. Uh, Many years ago, I had someone from the congregation come up to me and And I don't remember what we were talking about. He says, you know, I don't know how you pastors get up there and talk in front of all those people. And this guy was a farmer. And I said to him, I said, well, sort of the same way that you farm. And he looked at me, kind of dumbfounded. And he said, well, anybody can farm. And I said, are you kidding me? Have you seen my garden? You can come over, take a look. This year, I got nothing. I I planted pumpkins, beans, tomatoes, peppers, nothing. I was O for whatever. Um, And so for this guy to think anybody can farm, come over to my house, I'll show you. It's not, but the reason he thought anyone could do it was because it was easy for him. And so he thought it was easy for everybody. Well, no, it's easy because you're good at it, which means you are gifted. And if you are gifted, you are designed to do something. You have been created for a purpose. You have a role to play. Ephesians 2 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Now, there's a saying many of us are familiar with. It's, you can be anything you want to be. Now, what I like about that saying, what's good about it, is that it takes away, if we believe that, it can take away self-imposed limitations. And we really shouldn't. We shouldn't let our minds or our attitudes keep us from our goals. You can be anything you want to be. 
On the other hand, however, that statement is not completely true. Because while our attitude and our minds shouldn't keep us from our goals, sometimes, oftentimes, our abilities will. Okay, when I was a young teenager, I had visions of being a basketball star. It's not that funny. Come on, what's up with that? That wasn't even the joke part yet. Um, but uh, so yeah, I had, you know, I wanted to play high school, wanted to play college, wanted to play NBA, and I believed I could do it. I believed I could do it. Believing wasn't the problem. The problem was I wasn't the behemoth of the physical specimen that stands before you today. That was the problem. I know it may be hard for you to believe, but when I was a senior in high school, I was 5'10", 135 pounds. I was relatively slow and was a mediocre shooter at best. That wasn't going to cut it for basketball at any level. And that was okay. That was not my role. See, we don't choose our gifts. We choose how we use them. As one saying goes, or a paraphrase of a saying, it's not the cards we're dealt that matters, it's how we play the hand we've been given. Now, Moses' failure with the rock in the desert and him not being allowed to lead the people in the promised land. Again, I don't have time to unpack that story, but, but him not being allowed to lead the people in the promised land, it wasn't so much a punishment as it was that his failure in the desert showed that he did not have the gifts and abilities to lead in the promised land. See, Moses led the Israelites in the desert for 40 years, and he did a great job. But just because Moses was a great desert leader did not mean that he would be a good promised land leader. That was not how he was gifted. And so Joshua was the promised land leader. As it says in Deuteronomy 3, God tells Moses, go up to the top of Pisgah and look west and north and south and east and look at the land with your own eyes since you are not going to cross this Jordan. But commission Joshua and encourage and strengthen him for he will lead this people across and will cause them to inherit the land that you will see. You don't have to do it all. You do have to do your part. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Brian introduced something that we called the Shalom Project. And we recognize the whole motivation for this Shalom Project is that there's all sorts of chaos around us. This is not a scoop. Whether it's the political season we find ourselves in or the racial tensions or the violence or terrorism or economic uncertainty or whatever personal chaos that you are going through. The Shalom Project is a challenge for us to experience and express shalom, the word for peace. And so we've challenged you to pray for peace, to be looking for opportunities to bring peace to situations. And um, we even have cards in the back on kiosks for you to pick up if you'd like to take up the challenge, if you haven't already done so. Um, But we are not asking you to solve the conflict in Syria. We are also not asking you to bring relief to everyone who's been affected by Hurricane Matthew. Our world needs more peace. And so this is a challenge for you to play your role in bringing some peace, muchly needed peace to a situation or relationship that you are in a position to make an impact. You don't have to do it all. It's simply a challenge to do your part. And again, God's not calling us to try to be something that we're not. And we may not be able to be anything that we want to be. But there is deep joy and satisfaction that comes from doing what God has created us to do. You have been created for a God-given purpose. 
Perspective number two is that God has already carried out a great deal of good through you. God has already carried out a great deal of good through you. Verses six and seven says that God buried him, Moses, in Moab, in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died, and yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Now, some of Moses' accomplishments, and again, done through the power of God, but he was called by the burning bush and he confronted Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at the time. He brought the 10 plagues. He instituted the Passover meal, which is celebrated to this very day. He led people through the parted sea. He provided water and manna and quail in the desert. He climbed Mount Sinai to meet with God where he received the 10 commandments, which he would give to the Israelites. And he overcame the rebellion of the people as he was leading them over and over and over again. And he led the people in the desert for 40 years. And it says after all of that, that his eyes were not weak and his strength was not gone. Moses had more to give. He wasn't spent, but God said, you're done. Now, sometimes, oftentimes, we always look at what we haven't done, what we haven't accomplished yet. And we forget how far we have come and what has been accomplished through us. We value ourselves based upon what we still have left to give and we miss the value of what has already been contributed through us. Now, Moses did not lead the people into the promised land, but it's abundantly clear that they never would have gotten there without him. Look how far he brought them. He didn't get to cross the Jordan, but they never would have made it without him. Now, we're not done until God says we're done. But don't miss what God has done through us, through you. Now, some of you may say, well, you know, I really don't believe in God or I haven't believed in God for most of my life up to this point. So I'm really not sure how God has used me. And I just want to respond with this question for you. Do you think God needed your permission to use you? You think he was waiting for that? Now, it's always better to cooperate with God. Just ask Pharaoh, okay? But God doesn't need our permission to use us. Again, just ask Pharaoh. So don't be discouraged by what you don't get to do, but rather be encouraged of what God has done through you and what God may still have in store for you yet. Perspective number three is that Jesus is concerned with your future. On, again, the trip to Egypt, Jordan, Israel, that some of us went on last month, the leader of the trip, his name is George DeYoung, he pointed out something from this story that I hadn't caught before. And you have to fast forward all the way to the New Testament to catch it. It's Matthew chapter 17. After six days... Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Did you catch it? Moses made it to the promised land. He's there in Matthew 17. Now that wasn't Moses' plan on getting there. It wasn't Moses' way of getting there. It wasn't Moses' timing to get there, but he made it and Jesus got him there. When things don't go the way you've hoped or planned, 
I can't tell you all the reasons why things don't go the way we hope and plan, but I can tell you one reason why they, why not. When things don't go the way that you've hoped or planned, it's not because Jesus has abandoned you. He hasn't. Romans chapter 8 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus has not left you. He can still get you to a good place. And he will use both the good and the bad to do it. Jeremiah 29 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And Jesus says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Jesus has good plans for us, but we will have to take up our crosses to get there. Now look, I know that some tragic things have happened for all of us. Dreams that have been dashed, relationships that have been cut off and ended, financial hardship or maybe even financial ruin, or loved ones who die, or serious health questions that you are currently facing. And when those kinds of things happen, it's really easy It's really easy to give in to despair. And if you do, I wouldn't blame you. No judgment here. I wouldn't hold it against you. I really wouldn't. But to give in to despair, it just doesn't do us any good. It's not going to help you at all. But in order to not give in to despair, we need a reason to hope when the world has been turned upside down on us. And the best hope I can give you is Jesus is concerned with your present and your future, and he has not abandoned you. We want to know that life is still going to be good. And I don't know how he's going to do it, but Jesus can get us to the good in ways that we cannot even imagine. Look, Moses climbed to the top of Mount Nebo and he died there. And he was buried in the plains of Moab. And yet somehow, some way, over a thousand years later, Jesus got him into the promised land. Abraham, he was promised that his descendants would be a great nation. And he had no kids. And his wife was barren. And yet somehow God kept the promise. King David was promised that he would always have an heir on the throne. And just a few hundred years after that, the country was destroyed. And yet in Jesus, David has an eternal heir. Promise kept. Jesus promised his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. And I will be with you to the very end of the age. And they were nobodies from nowhere. Despite severe persecution and opposition, they changed the world. The world has never been the same since. Somehow Jesus made it happen. And Jesus tells us, in this world, you will have trouble. And yet he promises us, Take heart, I have overcome the world. It's an uncertain future. And so when we fall short of our expectations, we can put our hope in Jesus, knowing that he's got the future in his hands. I don't know how he's going to do it. But Jesus can and will use both the good and the bad to bring us to a better place. And we can't even imagine how he will do it. And so this morning, let us focus on Jesus, the one who we can always hope in, even when we fall short of our expectations.